everyone, welcome back to my Tomb Raider Angel of Darkness playthrough. Today is a very special bonus video. Today we're going to be going through the story of the cancelled Angel of Darkness trilogy. So we'll be going through the proposed plots for games 2 and 3 and also discussing the spin-off games that were supposed to star Curtis Trent. And I'll also be starting off by going through Lara's survival story after Last Revelation in a lot more detail. So this is basically just going to be a video of me talking. So definitely just sit back and relax, grab your drinks and your snacks and let's just get into it. So I'm going to start off by going through Lara's survival story. Now I did touch on this very briefly in my very first Angel of Darkness video. I showed the deleted cutscene and also talked a bit about Putai, the shaman who rescued her. But this is a much, much more detailed version. And I do just have to say a special thanks to subscriber MDB who actually commented about Lara's backstory under one of my videos and kind of inspired me to go into it in more detail. So all of this information I'm reading out, I have taken from the Tomb of Ash project, The Myth of El Hawa. Now this is a short film project that was created by Tomb of Ash. And I'm just going to read out the official information here. So the story of Tomb Raider, the myth of El Hawa, was written by the writer of Tomb Raider, the Angel of Darkness, Murty Schofield, and will finally provide a proper canon explanation of the events between to Tomb Raider games. The video is narrated by Jonelle Elliott, who of course is Lara Croft's voice actress in Last Revelation, Chronicles, and of course, The Angel of Darkness. I would highly recommend to watch that short film. It's so beautifully animated, beautifully told, and Jonelle's voice narrating it is just so beautiful. So I will leave a link to that film in the description box below. And also, if you wanted to show your appreciation to Tomb of Ash, there is a donate button at the top of their page as well. So this is really cool because, as it said, the writer of Angel of Darkness wrote this. It is considered canon, which means it is considered the official story. As we already know, Lara survived her fall at the end of Tomb Raider Last Revelation. After she fell and the tomb collapsed on top of her, Lara only just managed to fight her way out. And as we covered previously, the shaman Putai then found Lara. So my understanding is that she managed to crawl out from under the rubble and then she was kind of lying in the desert and Putai found her and rescued her. So at this point, Lara remembers that Putai poured water into her mouth, spread oil on her face and lips and brought her to a nearby camp. The tribe at this camp were known as the Bantiwa tribe and the Bantiwa were in awe of Putai. The Bantiwa agreed to take care of Lara and eventually they became like family to Lara. The Bantiwa let her stay there, nursed her back to health. Lara bonded with a warrior woman called Hamia and together they practiced fighting and combat. She really started to fit in and create bonds in the tribe and she also started to learn some things from them as well. Lara was in no rush to leave and wanted to understand what had happened to her in that tomb. She spent time traveling with the Bontiwa tribe through the plains of Africa. The Bontiwa were guardians of a great secret centered on an extraordinary botanical specimen. This plant was known as the Shimalal or Night's Tears. It had unique healing properties and was protected by the Bantiwa tribe. One night, the Bantiwa were attacked by a rival tribe led by a man called Scar. 
After many casualties on both sides, Lara almost killed Scar, but unfortunately he got away as the rival tribe retreated. The Bantiwa tribe and Butai were all so grateful to Lara and how she had defended them and helped them fight off these attackers, and she felt like she was completely accepted into the tribe. And they gave her the nickname El Hawa, which means desert wind. So after escaping, Scar then went around telling people that he had fought bravely against some demonic entity and a myth grew that the Bantiwa were protected by El Hawa, an avenging angel. And that's really interesting because that makes me think that's where the name of the game came from, Angel of Darkness. Because I never really understood before why the game was called Angel of Darkness. But this kind of links in with it and actually makes a lot of sense. Clara remained with the Bantiwa, studying historic runes and artifacts and learning more about the elixir of the Shimalal, which was a healing oil, and learning all about other ancient marvels. Lara said she was in heaven. However, Lara eventually decided to return to England to deal with the loose ends and affairs that she needed to deal with there. But she decided that when all of her affairs were sorted in England, she would return to the Bantiwa tribe. On parting, Putai hands Lara an amulet. And again, I think this is the amulet that we saw in that cutscene, this kind of mystical amulet of protection and power. Lara returns to England and has to sort out with solicitors the fact that she is actually not dead. Unfortunately, while Lara was in England, she received word that the Bontiwa tribe have been massacred, completely wiped out without a trace. Lara was devastated. She decided that she needed to travel back to find out the truth of what happened to them. Lara figured that if Scar wasn't the one responsible, then he would at least know who was. So she decided paying him a visit was a good place to start. But just as Lara was about to leave England, she received a message from Von Croy in Paris. Von Croy was asking Lara for her help. Lara decided to take a detour on her way back to Africa and to stop off first in Paris. She wanted to give the traitor Von Croy a piece of her mind. And we all know how that turned out. That is the start of the Angel of Darkness game. That is an absolutely excellent short film. Again, I have it linked in the description box below and I would highly recommend that you go check it out. It's such a wonderful watch. And thank you so much to Tomb of Ash for making that happen. Okay, so moving on to the Angel of Darkness games. So as we all know, Angel of Darkness was originally supposed to be a trilogy of games. There was supposed to be game two and game three. Now again, I need to say thank you so much to Tomb of Ash. Their website has been invaluable for me doing this research. I found a ton of documents on their website, official verified documents from Core and from Murty Schofield, the writer of Angel of Darkness, that contained all this information about the plans for Angel of Darkness. I've linked them all in the description box below if you do want to read them yourself. And again, if you do want to show your appreciation for Tomb of Ash, you can donate on their website. So here was the planned story for the second game. Corel, our shape-shifting Nephilim, has survived. Instead of being incinerated by that column of light along with the sleeper at the end of the Angel of Darkness game. It said that Corel instead had a transformative reaction. In other words, he was destroyed and reformed into something more powerful. And in Murty Schofield's notes, 
this theory is based on the alchemic maxim dissolve a coagule, which basically means destroy and reform. I'm not 100% sure on it because I don't understand alchemy or chemistry or anything like that. Corel has survived and he has retreated to Eckhart's cabal base and stronghold in Cappadocia in Turkey. I don't know if I said Cappadocia correctly. I'm sorry if I didn't. And when Corel arrives to Eckhart's cabal base in Turkey, he then takes the form of Eckhart and proceeds to pretend to be him to control the cabal, whatever's left of it, and give them orders and stuff like that. He is still putting his shape-shifting ability to use. Then Gunderson, who has survived as well, would now be some kind of super boss where he is able to command hordes of armed squads or monsters for Lara to take out. Just to point out as well, sorry, that the, the notes that I'm taking all this information from, they're very, very rough story notes. They're, some of them are almost in kind of bullet point form. It was literally just at the stage of jotting down ideas. I've tried my best to organize it into a story and a way that makes sense. But if it does seem a little bit disjointed or something, um, I'm sorry about that. And there was also meant to be another surviving member of the Cabal. This character was actually supposed to be in the first game, but he was cut, I presume, for time as well. There was meant to be a character called Ruzik the Illusionist. He was also meant to have survived and be in the second game. And reading through the notes and stuff, this actually sounded like a really cool character because he would create these illusions to confuse Lara and Lara would have to fight through them and everything. It sounded really, really cool. At this point where Karel has escaped to the Cabal base and takes the form of Eckhart and is controlling the Cabal, he learns that there were three Nephilim sleepers. And so the search begins for the two remaining sleepers. So at the start of game two, Curtis has survived and managed to crawl into the vault of trophies. Curtis then fell into a protective toxic coma and much, much later, he awoke after healing while in this coma and escaped back to Utah, where his mother and tribal elders nursed him back to health. Later on, Curtis hears rumors of Carell's survival and following a hunch about where a certain Lux Veritatis secret room might be located, heads to the fortress of Montsegur in France. Basically, Curtis had this hunch for a long time that this secret Lux Veritatis room he's been searching for is below the fortress of Montsegur in France. And when he hears that Corel might be alive and hears rumors of a lot of weird stuff happening, he's like, I better go and find this room and check it out because we need what's gonna be in that room. Curtis does indeed find this Lux Veritatis secret room and in it he discovers vital clues as to where the Lux Veritatis hid the last two Nephilim sleepers. This is where Curtis finds out that the sleepers are hidden at an ancient site in Turkey. Meanwhile, Lara has been recuperating in North Africa with her once mentor, Putai. I guess at the end of Angel of Darkness, Lara doesn't manage to find Curtis because uh, he's like crawled into the vault of trophies, even though it kind of suggested that the Chirugai blade would point the way to him, but it's fine. Lara couldn't find him and just left and decided to recover and rejuvenate herself and her energy by meeting up again with Putai and presumably as well she was like well now I need to continue the mission that I actually started out doing which was trying to find out what happened and avenge the death of the Bantiwa tribe. While she is with Putai, Lara hears rumours of Karel's survival and begins 
to track him down. At this point, Joachim Carell seeks out Morgo, Matthias Vasily's daughter. Now, I do believe in, was it part seven? I think it was part seven. I think I called her Morgan in that. I don't know where I got that from or why I thought her name was Morgan. Her name is actually, I think it's pronounced Morgo, M-O-R-G-A-U. My bad for that. Um, I'm just gonna call her Morgo and I hope that's right. Morgo is Matthias Vasily's daughter. And when Carell finds her, he tortures her into translating the sleeper scrolls that reveal the location of these two other Nephilim sleepers. Now, I do want to spend some time actually talking about Morgo Vasily because she is a fascinating character and her story is so, so amazing. I'm so sad she got cut from the first game and then I'm so sad we never got to see her in games two or three. Morgo Vasily was born in 1983 and spent her early years as a fugitive alongside her father, Matthias Vasily. Morgo was trained from a young age in the ways of the Lux Veritatis, much like Curtis. But years living as a fugitive caused her to become a dangerous and unpredictable individual with a wild card personality. Well before her father's murder, Morgo would disappear on her own and put herself into perilous situations. She was a little bit reckless, quite rebellious. She worked for Martin Gunderson's The Agency for a while, just like Curtis did. It is said that Morgo did not like Gunderson and avoided contact with him as much as possible. Again, I couldn't find any more information than that. I couldn't find out how she ended up working for the agency, exactly what she did, why she didn't like Gunderson. Eventually, Morgo gets caught up in a vicious attack on a Lux Veritatis base. Now, I didn't 100% understand in the notes if she was part of maybe an agency group attacking the Lux Veritatis base or if she was in the Lux Veritatis base and was attacked. I'm not 100% sure on that. But anyway, during this attack, she was badly wounded and captured by the forces of the dark alchemist Eckhart. Now, just to mention very briefly here, again, there's much more detail in the notes and I have them all linked below if you do want to go read up on it yourself. But this is just a very interesting bit of info on the Chirugai blade. Morgo Vasily stole the Chirugai blade from Constantine, Curtis's father. However, Morgo struggled to control it. So she could use it somewhat because she herself is a Lux Veritatis member, but she didn't have the training that Curtis had to use it and she just couldn't control it properly. And again, this kind of shows what a rogue and a wild card she was because even though she herself was a Lux Veritatis member, she didn't really consider herself to have any allies or be on any particular side. I think Morgo was always just kind of out for herself. So that's why I think with the Chirugai blade, she just kind of saw it, wanted it, took it. She has the Chirugai blade on her during this attack where she gets captured. So just before she was captured and not wanting the Chirugai blade to fall into Cabal hands, Morgo threw the Chirugai blade into the icy depths of the Goatland. She threw it into the sea around this Goatland, which is a large Swedish island. Again, so sorry if I'm saying all that wrong. When Morgo threw the blade into the sea, she fully intended to return to get it at a later date whenever she had managed to escape from the Cabal. But unfortunately, she would never get to do this. The blade was eventually tracked down and recovered by Marie Cornell, Curtis's mother. She tracked it down, retrieved it, to then pass it on to Curtis after Constantine's death. 
So I thought that was a really, really cool bit of information. This is where the story gets really, really sad. During Morgo's imprisonment, Peter van Eckhart tortured her extensively and he then used her as an experiment to merge human and Nephilim DNA. Kind of a similar type experiment to the proto-Nephilim. They were just experimenting with Nephilim DNA to see what they could create, basically. They turned Morgo into what is known as a Neph human. And Eckhart then wanted to breed these to be the perfect warrior sentinels for the coming reemergence of the Nephilim race. Morgo was kind of his first experiment and then he was going to make a lot more of these. Morgo possesses super strength and speed. She can sustain a lot of damage and heal very fast and she also possesses psychic abilities. She has a mix of attributes from being a Lux Veritatis initiate so she has a lot of the same abilities as Curtis, but she also has a lot of enhancements to her abilities because she's also part Nephilim as well. After this transformation, Morgo's skin is albino white and it is semi-transparent and you can partially see her internal organs through her skin. This mutilation left her dependent on Eckhart's alchemic elixirs and essences to stay alive. Without taking these elixirs, her body would kind of just disintegrate. I think the explanation is that her human body was not built to support Nephilim DNA. Morgo's eyes are milky blue until her psychic powers are triggered and then they turn translucent, which sounds terrifying. And they do say that Morgo does not really have control over her psychic powers. They're very volatile, very unpredictable. So that's why it says when her powers are triggered. So I guess maybe when she's scared or angry or something like that. Morgo wears body armor that houses the elixirs and essences needed to keep her alive. And this armor is actually built to interlock with rods welded into her spine. The armor kind of goes into her spine. It's part of her body. And then I think she can like put the elixirs and essences into it and they kind of like are injected into her, something like that. Um, it just sounds horrifying. Morgo only has access to these elixirs through the cabal. And this is how they control, blackmail and manipulate her. Morgo is unstable and a danger to all around her, foes and allies alike. Although she wouldn't consider anyone to be her ally. She kind of is just on her own side, out for herself. She feels like everyone's against her and she's just gonna look out for herself and look out for her own survival. The character of Morgo Vasily just sounded so awesome. I would have loved to have seen that character in a game. So now that we know who Morgo is, let's go through a few more of the plot points of the second game. Karel considers Morgo to be a shadow version of Lara. Karel genuinely offered for Lara to join with him at the end of the Angel of Darkness game and thought that she would be very useful to him and he thinks the exact same thing about Morgo Vasily. So we said a little while ago that Karel started out shape-shifting and pretending to be Eckhart in order to have control of the Cabal and give them orders. Well, he eventually does reveal himself to just be Karel and reveals that Eckhart is dead and eventually the Cabal do just accept Karel as their new leader. Karel now controls Morgo not only by providing her with the elixirs but also by promising her 
that there is at least a partial cure for her condition. Corel tells her that there is an ancient Mayan genome sequence that could reverse the damage done to her body. But in the notes, Murty Schofield did note that unfortunately, this is a lie. There is no Mayan genome sequencer that can cure her. Morgo carries out Corel's bidding at this chance to live and be cured. Morgot is so desperate to find a cure and to live because at this stage, Morgot's body has actually started to erupt in crystalline growths. As we already witnessed on Bouchard's Man in Paris, these kind of gloopy silver things have started to grow all over her body and eventually, they will suffocate her. I think it's really important to understand the absolute desperation that Morgot must be feeling at this point. As we already mentioned, Carell does torture and blackmail Morgot into translating the sleeper scrolls, which reveal the location of these two remaining sleeper Nephilim. He and Morgot then head to the ancient site indicated to find the sleepers. When Corel and Morgo arrive at this ancient site, it comes to light that one sleeper was actually already destroyed by the Lux Veritatis a long time ago. There is only one sleeper left. One more chance to revive the Nephilim. So Lara, learning of Corel's plans to use the two remaining sleepers to revive the Nephilim race, fights her way to the Cabal base in Turkey. And it was noted that Lara would eventually defeat Corel and destroy the Nephilim sleeper. Of course, or it would have been a pretty bad game. And it's also interesting to note here that in this game, Lara would have become an honorary Lux Veritatis member as she has and wields all three of the Periapt shards. The plan was to kind of, I think, make her a Lux Veritatis initiate in game two. And also there were notes that said maybe Lara could learn how to use the Chirugai blades and some other kind of Lux Veritatis skills, which again sounds awesome. And a final amazing note on this game. In game two, it was noted that Lara begins to unearth evidence of how Eckhart's work seems to have had an astounding influence on her own roots, her family and her bloodline and that of many prominent figures throughout history. This is a quote that I took from Murty Schofield's notes. We are offered a disturbing possibility that something or someone is responsible for many of the enhanced individuals that have marked the pages of history with their achievements. Is there something to the theory of a shared ancestry for all the heroes we admire and know so well? Who knows? I think what was being hinted at there is that Lara will find some clue in Eckhart's work that her, her family, her ancestors are from a particular line of people and that if we look at all the people throughout history who have achieved amazing things, they will all share the same ancestry, the same bloodline and that there is some reason for that. I don't know if it was maybe supposed to be that they were part Nephilim or there was something slightly mystical going on, which is a really, really cool concept. I actually love that. Game two sounded like it was gonna be amazing. Now, I couldn't find that many notes on game three, unfortunately. Of course, they wouldn't have hugely planned out game three yet. And because everything was canceled, they wouldn't have worked on it any further but this is the information that I found. Various branches of Eckhart's breeder program, as it's called, so his obsession with mixing Nephilim DNA with things and breeding new races. Various branches of these programs from the 13 to 1400s have survived 
and continue in various remote parts of the world. As the Nazis were being defeated at the end of World War II, they shipped equipment, research data, materials and personnel off to their remote Antarctic base which had been constructed in the 1930s. Basically, one of Eckhart's breeder programs was obviously operated by the Nazis um, and they specially built a base for it in a very remote part of Antarctica so they wouldn't be bothered, I guess. And just before they were defeated, they kind of sent all of their resources to the base so the program could continue. In this base, they would continue with the breeder program and guess where Lara and Curtis will end up next. So that was just a very brief synopsis of kind of what was planned for the third game, which is really, really interesting. And also just to mention quickly, it was planned that in the third game, Curtis would stop seeing Morgo as an enemy or an obstacle to his plan. I guess he would realize that Morgo is being manipulated by the Cabal and she's not actually on their side. So what is Curtis's plan? Curtis has a plan in the third game to reform and recruit for the Lux Veritatis. A lot of the Lux Veritatis have been wiped out by Eckhart, so Curtis has this plan to recruit and rebuild up the Lux Veritatis order. And in the third game, he and Morgot will team up together to carry out this plan. So that's really cool, a little bit of a redemption arc for Morgot in game three. And on that note, let's get into our final section, which is going to be the proposed Curtis Trent spin-off games. From what I could see, again, the notes are very all over the place and very at the idea stage. So there was a lot of different ideas of what the games could be. From what I could read, there was two main names and different types of games proposed. One of the games proposed was going to be called Curtis Trent Demon Hunter. This game would be a prequel from Curtis's early days. It would not feature Lara, but if they changed it to being set after Angel of Darkness, then Lara could have a guest appearance in the game. This game would focus on just after Curtis ran away from his parents and joined the Foreign Legion living in Paris. At this point, Curtis's life is dogged by demonic forces popping up everywhere, even though he has abandoned his Lux Veritatis past. But he has no hesitation using his abilities developed during his early training. He cannot deny his upbringing or his destiny. And there was a lot of ideas written down for this game. Uh, I'm just going to very briefly summarize them. They're very long documents. So there were some ideas like Curtis going around taking out threats and demons. Curtis being maybe a mercenary for hire. Curtis fighting rogue Lux Veritatis members. And the most interesting one to me was Curtis traveling to Utah and teaming up with his mother to wipe out attacking cabal forces, which also does confirm that Curtis's mother is actually still alive. And of course, in this game, Curtis would have his full range of abilities. All of that would be fully finished and fully playable in this game. Then the other game idea was Curtis Trent Bloodline. Now I did read a good few different ideas for what the story of this game could be, but I'm just going to go through the main most fleshed out ones. The first idea involved Curtis hunting down the demon Lucifer while the countdown to Armageddon is ticking. The demon Lucifer can possess anybody he wants and is trying to release a deadly virus on the world. And if you read through the detailed story in the documents, it's so interesting because Lucifer can hop into and possess anybody he wants. So Curtis has no idea, 
you know, who the demon could be at any point and it's really interesting. Curtis and Lucifer eventually face off and an epic battle ensues. Curtis defeats Lucifer and manages to contain the virus, but in this final battle he is drained by the power that this took and Curtis collapses. Curtis has now lost his paranormal powers and is a human. I thought that was a really cool plot idea for a game. I, I really, really liked that. Another idea for this Bloodline game is that it will be set in New York City between 1998 and 2000. So Curtis sleeps in his car and earns a living as a bounty hunter. He is running from his ancestral past and present day demons. Meanwhile, New York City sits on one end of an interdimensional time bridge, which spans the gulf between the demon dimension and our own. And this plot gives me such angel vibes, like Angel, the TV show, the spin-off of Buffy the Vampire Slayer. I love the show Angel and this just really reminds me of it. It sounds quite similar, quite a similar vibe to it. And I love that because I love the show Angel, or at least I love it up until Connor is born, but that's a discussion for another time. Demons plan to break the ancient seals at this bridge and invade the earth. A chance meeting with a mysterious priest becomes Curtis's salvation and leads him to develop his paranormal powers, claim his ancestral birthright, and ultimately save the city from the forces of darkness. Really, really cool. Love, love, love that. And another option for the game was for Lara to potentially go missing at the start of the game, so then presumably this game would take place after the events of Angel of Darkness and Curtis would then spend the game searching for her, fearing that the Cabal are involved in Lara's disappearance. Which I actually think that's probably the best one just because you can tie it in with Tomb Raider and you know Lara will kind of feature in the game and make an appearance. I think if they were going to go for an option that probably would have been the best one to go with honestly. But it is widely believed that Curtis was part of Kor's idea to move away slightly from Lara Croft and Tomb Raider and to make something new. I think that's why they put so much effort into trying to develop this character of Curtis and make him playable and then to have him have his own games then because they really did want to just do something new. As we said previously, they were kind of sick of Tomb Raider at this stage and wanted to do something a little bit different. So as I said, there were many, many more story ideas and different notes and stuff like that but they're kind of the main ones and the most interesting ones I think. It took me a really really long time to read through all of those documents and try and make some kind of a coherent video out of them. So I do hope this video wasn't too confusing. Thank you so much for watching this video. I do hope you enjoyed it. If you did, I would really appreciate if you would consider liking, commenting, or subscribing if you haven't already. It really does help me out. Thank you so much for joining me for my Angel of Darkness playthrough, and I will see you really, really soon when we start into Legend.